Bonjour, mon petit pois, bonne de douche, or as they say, how you doing? So, welcome to Opposition Outcome on Falls from Iron. I'm Gatesy. Um, you might want to introduce yourself, young man. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm from the Pride of Villa. Obviously, if you've watched Forge from Iron, you would have seen the other half of us in Nathan. He did a really nice match preview for the channel. Um, and obviously, we're here today to talk about uh, match review, everything that went on in Aston Villa versus West Ham, and just see really what went wrong for Villa and then also what went great for West Ham. Yeah. And... As usual, guys, don't forget to drop a like on the stream, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and make sure you hit the bell icon to be notified of any new content as and when we upload it to the channel. And please also consider giving your support to uh, the Pride of Villa on YouTube. You can subscribe to them, and you've also got their Twitter and Instagram handles there. This will all be in the description below YouTube and Facebook for you guys to refer back to and give them your support, please. So, Ben... We got to talk about what happened yesterday afternoon at Villa Park. Oh, Two yes. hordes of claret and blue coming together. Um, we'll go to, right to the very beginning. Before a ball was even kicked, uh, around about an hour before the kickoff, the teams were announced. And a few things were obviously different in from the previous match, principally that there was no Danny Ings in the squad at all, he being injured. Tyrone Mings, your club captain, was on the bench. Leon Bailey got his first start in an Aston Villa shirt. And Dean Smith made a change to the formation from the previous match. What, what were your thoughts when all of that um, came came to pass? Well, it was one of those that had been boiling for a while. Obviously, Villa losing 3-1 last week against Arsenal away, playing a 5-3-2. It was just tumultuous. It didn't work. Our fullbacks weren't getting back to cover our centre halves, um, and it really had questioned a lot of supporters why we were playing like this. Why were we not sticking with a four-three-three? Um, something that Dean Smith's always liked to play, considering he's got that attacking philosophy. Um, so coming into the news of the team for the game, uh, I'd already heard that Ings, Mings, and um, Louise might not be playing in the game, which was a bit worrying, especially from uh, the likes of Mings. Obviously, as you said, their club captain. He's the one that, for a lot of us, is somebody that we wouldn't see Dean Smith dropping, but he did. He went very bold with that. Obviously, going back to the roots of the 4-3-3, some nice attacking um, formation there to go with when playing against a team like West Ham, who are really going to come at us as well with those wide players and Mikel Antonio. Um, obviously Leon Bailey really having the star moment against Everton and we've been all clamouring for him to really have a go in the team and he gets that starting lineup alongside Wendy on the right who's been playing as number 10 and it's just not worked seeing what Ollie Watkins can do getting that number 9 position back to him um, it was going to be very interesting to see I was very happy with the team um, obviously I would have liked Louise just because I thought against Arsenal he was um, our best player trying to get the ball moving forward and give our team a chance um, but I instantly remember seeing the lineup and then seeing West Ham seeing how strong they were going to go when you've got Suchek and Rice in that midfield it's just going to be a battle to get through and plus your two strong centre halves it was just I wasn't confident all week but even seeing that team there, it, was just, it still wasn't going to happen but in terms of Villa itself um yeah, I was happy. It's what I wanted. It's what a lot of the fans wanted. Um, and so it did give us a bit of confidence there. And then obviously we went into the game and it all changed after that. Yes, yes. It all went a little bit pear-shaped after seven minutes when young Ben Johnson, who's obviously come in at right back in place of Vladimir Tufal and done exceptionally well, cuts mm. inside. You know, he was on the right-hand side, gets released by a ball from Declan Rice. Cuts inside the defender. Let's go with a left foot drive into the bottom corner uh, past Martinez. Could he have done better with the goal, do you think? Or is that an unfair criticism? I think, because from what I remember, he, he didn't get to be able to see the goal very well. I think it was either that <clears> one or the second one. I think um, both of them, he was, he was making sort of remonstrations about. I certainly remember with the, the Declan Rice goal, he was saying he couldn't see it. Yeah, but um, I think it's more of an issue just from midfield, not closing him down. Um, it felt like at that point, you know, West Ham were just playing it about with the ball, trying to fill up the opposition. Obviously, as you said, they're Ben Johnson doing really well on the edge of the box. 
um, cuts inside, left foot, bottom, right corner, um, absolutely slots after seven minutes. And we're all thinking, oh, bloody hell, here we go. It's all gone now. It's all gone. Um, it's not the start we want. Um, but he was more so in that case, okay, we've gone the goal down. Let's see what type of reaction we're going to get from Villa. And we did essentially get one in a few minutes later. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Before you obviously got that goal, however, there was young Jacob Ramsey who got the goal the previous week at the Emirates for you guys. Um, he he got uh, picked up a bit of an injury, and on came Ashley Young. How how do you think that affected you, or do you not really think that it did? In in fairness, oh, it was massive. You know, we myself included last season I didn't think Jacob Ramsey for his first time in the Premier League wasn't great but showed a lot of promise coming into this season he did really really well um, obviously got drops of Wendy could play in that number 10 role we're all crying out to see him again gets the goal against Arsenal really nice goal for him first goal for the club um, and it's thinking that Right, he's starting today, he's going to have that impact. He's someone that does like to hold the ball a little bit more and drive at players. And that's what's going to be keen trying to trying to manipul- manipulate and break down West Ham's defence. Um, and then obviously the injury came and it's massively blown a wrench in our system because without him, we haven't really got the same level of options. We had Chuck Wemmicker or Aaron Ramsey, but they're just not at the same standard just as yet as Jacob Ramsey. And then the substitute being Ashley Young, who's, you know, he's played a lot of positions, but he's not played centre mid. And mm. again, going back to my substitutes, you're bring, you've got two naturally born players there who can play in that position, yet you're bringing on somebody that we mostly associate for playing on the left back or left wing side yeah. of the pitch. So it was massively um, detrimental to Villa trying to get someone out of the game. But you recovered well from that because a, ma- a matter of 19 minutes after that substitution, which, as you say, was was quite detrimental to your your hopes and aspirations up to that point. Um, John McGinn plays in Buendia. He cuts the ball back to an unmarked, and that's the thing is that as, as a West Ham fan, was quite annoying for me. He, he no one was in the same postcode as him. He managed to find a pocket of space in the box. No one was near him. Ball comes to him, bang, one all, and you know Villa Park goes explodes. Um, when that ball hits the back of the net, you must have been thinking, "Here we go, game time." Well, yeah, I mean, I thought after you'd scored that goal, apart from one or two chances, I thought West Ham was sitting back a little bit more, soaking up yeah. that pressure. Um, I think Matty Cash, you know, we'll get onto man the matches later, but I thought he was having a sublime game at that point. Um, really driving at the defence, obviously, nice bit of link up there between him, McGinn and Buendia. Ball comes in and Watkins, which he's done a lot last season, you know, really in the box goals, he's able to put it away. But 1-1, one, one, we're thinking... We're back in this now. We've shown a great reaction. Um, the football at that point has been much better. We're getting the ball forward. Um, and then, yeah, as I said, a great reaction. And we're thinking, we're going to get it. We're going to get back into this. There was a really good, nice high spirit in the stadium. Um, and it could have went either way at that point, And it did go away four minutes later. Yeah, four minutes later, Saeed Ben Rama has the ball. There's nothing on for him sort of like in front he's a bit crowded out he passes the ball to Declan Rice who gets the ball out of his feet and he's got this in his locker I mean this was his first Premier League goal but he's got he's obviously got goals in Europe so far this season gets the ball out of his feet and unleashes this low drive past Martinez and after the ball hits the back of the net as we spoke earlier he he was complaining that he couldn't see it until late and watching it back I can see what he's on about but that that must have been quite a body blow that you know four minutes after you've taken the lead and some seven minutes from half time you, you're back to one down again yeah complete sting in our you know any chance of us getting into the game again you know it's the same with the first goal that was the issue that I found with that first half just no closing down just not really having the same effort and desire that West Ham had you know, and that's the thing that's really impressed me with Declan Rice. You know, 
he's gotten goals before, as you said, both in Europe and for the club. But he really feels like recently he's really put that into his game that he's going to drive more at the pitch, really push forward more and try and get involved in those goals. And as you said, that low driven shot into the bottom corner again, Villa go 2-1 down. He's celebrating in front of the whole tend um, after apparently a possible transfer to Villa years ago from what I understand. Um, really? It's just, yeah, apparently there was a loan um, on the cards for him. He wanted it, but never materialised. Interesting. I was unaware of that. Well, I've got the sources. You live but, um, and learn. <laughs> but it was, oh, it's the defla- it's flame when you get that high up from a game. I imagine you have felt it as well. Every fan would have felt it, something yep. like that. You get the goal, you think your confidence is back, the momentum was. And as I said, you know, it really did feel like at that point we could have pushed on for 2-1. But just Villa being Villa, not closing down enough, and ultimately West Ham take that first half by 2 1. Yeah, and obviously that goal coming seven minutes from half time changes the complexion of the team talks that both managers would have kicked out. I mean, I can sit there as, as here as a West Ham fan and say that I think that David Moyes would have given a few verbal volleys to some of our players, but. You know, I, I can imagine probably a similar thing happened in the Villa dressing room, in fairness, from, from Dean Smith. And to be fair, you, you come out in the second half and I, I thought you, you started quite well, but we get four minutes into the second half and there was the probably the big talking point of the match was two incidents that followed back to back. There was a clash between Courtney Holes and Pablo Fornells where I think it's fair to say that Courtney Holes had his arm, you know, level with Fornells' head. Let's put it that way. <laughs> whether you think he was fending him off, whether you think he's, he's given him a, a, a intentional whack is, is open to your own interpretation. But the ball then breaks forwards following on from that. The referee actually played the advantage because the ball broke and Jared Bowen was was in on goal and he gets pulled back by um, by uh, Esri Konza. The VAR looks at both incidents back to back, decides that there's no action to be taken for the four nails challenge. However, the Bowen pullback because he was the last man that by the letter of the law, the referee who initially gave a yellow card had to upgrade it to a red card. Um, what were your initial thoughts on, on both of those incidents? Well, with the house one, I hadn't actually seen it. It's one of those things that you just unfortunately miss when you're at the game. I saw it afterwards and I thought, you know, I was listening to talk sport earlier and I can understand the reasoning behind it with how high he's gone and almost the intent in that arm. It really does look like he's gone into him with um, the elbow. And usually when you see stuff like that, it's violent conduct and it is a red card. Um, so I'm not really fussed about that one. The cons are red card. I don't think it's a red card just because I don't think, you know, Bowen is it's one-on-one. I know it's very easy to say that, you know, he's going to go through and go and score. But considering the angle is that and considering how close Konza is with him man-to-man, I don't really see that being a clear goal-scoring opportunity. You never know with football. He could he could do something skillful. He could really get around and be a bit clever. But for me, it's not enough to warrant a red card. I initially thought it was a penalty just because of how close it was um, to the box. But luckily, it was just outside. I thought that one was incredibly harsh I think a yellow was the better result from I just didn't I just couldn't see that being um a red card at all so you so it's fair to say you you think that Konza was un, unfair or unlucky but Hall's maybe got away with it yeah I think either way one of them should have had a red card um again going back to the Arsenal game last week mentally it looked like four of our players could have had a red card. And I think that's something that Mm. Dean Smith could have maybe tried to implement into this game this week. And we're playing a very tough team in form, um, mentally keep your heads right. And I think when you go two one down and considering the way we were playing and we have been playing, it's very easy to not be at your best. And I think, as I said, they have either one of them could have got a red card. I think House is the more likely one that should have had it, but it is what it is. Villa got down to 10, and at that point, I turned to my man and just said, it's not going to happen anymore. Well, there was another opportunity that you had, in fairness, and Fabianski was called into action with a header that 
got um, Ollie Watkins got his head to the ball and the merest of fingertips, but it was, it was crucial, a crucial touch. He pushes it onto the bar and we managed to scramble the ball away going down the other end in the 69th minute. Declan Rice had a free kick. Martinez got down low. So both teams had opportunities around the sort of middle section of the second half, just couldn't put the ball away. But then there was an incident that happened in this round of 79th minute between Pablo Fornells and marvelous Nakamba. Whether you think he's marvel marvelous, is up to you. Oh, um, was, was. <laughs> but there was there was a 50-50 ball. I mean, the ball was there to be to be got at by both players. Both players have gone flying in. Um, they both collided with one another, and Nakamba's reaction was a little bit over, over the, the top, top. I thought, yes, uh, you know, I'm sure he was hurt. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that that he was hurt. Pablo Fornells was hurt. It was coming together. Um, I thought that the reaction. And I'm saying this as a West Ham fan. In my opinion, I think that that was Nakamba trying to even the score in terms of the playing numbers. Um, but again, you're at the match. That happened. What was your initial reaction to that? Well, with that one, it was very much, as I said, 50-50. They've both got to go for the ball. We saw a lot of that in the game um, earlier in the night. Um, I think for now has caught him. Marvellous has clearly won the ball. I think, as you say, the reaction is completely overdone. It's all over social media, him just rolling around like a shrimp out of water. Um, he's absolutely milking it. And it's obvious why he's trying to even those numbers up. He wants the game at 10 v 10. Yeah. Um, I would argue should have been a yellow though, considering, you know, it's late. He hasn't won the ball at all. It should be a yellow. But my issue then... What, for four nows? Yeah. He did get a yellow. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. Completely forgot that. They, but they all got a yellow. Um, but my issue then comes with what happens to the aftermath with Bowen and McGinn. Yeah. Now, I wanted to rather ask you this because I... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm fine. A, I'm 100% certain on where I stand with this. Do you think Bowen should have received a red card for how he lashed out at McGinn? Hmm... I've seen them given. Do I think it should have been no? Uh, I, I I think quite honestly, I think McGinn. What was what was he sort of getting involved for? It had nothing to do with him. But mm. yeah, I mean, listen. If if it had, if it had been red, I wouldn't have agreed with it. But I I would have understood why it was given. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean. When you're in the stadium, when you're there live, you're obviously going to have a different mindset yeah. when you're watching it on the TV. I think when you see that lashing out, and I saw it there, it really did feel like there was no intent there to try and break or calm the situation. And he's gone full charge him, completely pushed McGinn over. And then when you're, as a footballer, that you're going to obviously try and milk the system mm. um, to get the game in your advantage. Um, and I do feel that uh, at the very minimum, Bowen, Bowen, sorry, should be seen a yeah, uh, he did see a yellow card, but he, he should, did, could have yeah. seen more. Um, I just thought the referee as a whole had a poor game, a lot of really silly fouls going either way there. Um, and then in, ten, in the last 10 minutes, what did Villa do? Completely throw it away. Yeah, and of course, it was about a minute or so after the incident between Four Nows and Nakamba that who pops up and scores West Ham's third. You guessed Four it. Nows. It was Pablo Four Nows. <laughs> uh, Bowen was, was again instrumental in it. So the other player that was in West Ham, from West Ham that was involved in that situation a minute or so earlier, both were involved in that third goal. I, I'm guessing at that point, I, and I've been in that situation as a West Ham fan many, many times where something happens in a match and you're like, you know, you, you obviously you're caught up in the emotion of the match and you think that maybe you're a little bit hard done by. And then a player that was involved in that situation goes and puts the ball in the back of your net and you're sitting there going, <laughs> Oh for goodness sake. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that's probably you, what was your thought process at that time? It's completely, it just summarized it there, you know, when he went 3-1, it was starting to get really, really bad. I mean, Villa, credit to him, when they went 10, pe 10 oh God, when it was 10 men on their team, um, they played some much better football, as you said. I thought earlier. you were the better team, if I'm being honest, at that yeah. point. 
yeah, completely. I thought West Ham started to really slow down their games, not really try and um, go for it as much. Um, but you know, when you when you've got ten men to play against, there's always that chance to counter attack. When you've got Bowen and um, Antonio and the pace players that you do, that counter attack mm. is very much there. Obviously, Villa playing a really, really high intensity at that point, trying to get the goal back. And when you do that, when you commit so many bodies forward, you know what's going to happen. West Ham play some really good football there. Um, and obviously, Fornals is able to get the goal. And it just summed it up in the crowd. I looked around and I'm starting to see people leaving. And it's yeah. it's not really a surprise because the game was over. We weren't going to get back into it. Um you just think, oh, surely it can't get any worse. And lo and behold, it gets worse. Well, and, and this is this is the thing, Ben. I mean, again, I've I've trod that path. You know, I've I've supported West Ham for well, probably longer than you've been alive. Let's oh, put definitely. it leave it let's leave it like that. That's fine, um, <laughs> but um, you know, I've I have i have been there and, and when you're at that part, you know, you're in that section of the league and, and games are going against you and you go on a run three, four games, you know, I think it is now that you're you've lost four. in succession four games. And sometimes when you need that slice of luck in that situation, you don't get it. And that's just, just the way it goes. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's a horrible, horrible situation. And I've been, I've, like I say, we've trod that path many, many times. And, and as you say, four minutes after West Ham's third, then goes a fourth Antonio driving into the box. He fed Manuel Lanzini, who played a beautiful pass. I mean, he probably could have had a go at goal himself, but he's mm. obviously he's seen Jared Bowen out the corner of his eye and he feeds him unselfishly. And Bowen made no mistakes, puts the ball in the back of the net 4-1. And again, I, I dare say that was a real dagger to the heart moment for, for you guys. Yeah, again, he was completely the same as the third goal. Nice bit of play. Um, Antonio, I thought we'd done really well to keep him quiet throughout the game. Um, it was just a really bad mess up from House. Um, I think a lack of concentration as the probably result. Probably tiredness. Yeah, probably. Um, and then Bo- Bowen's able to put the goal away. It really starts to get empty <clears throat> now. The boos get louder. Um, and I turn to m- again, I turn to my mate and I say, this is like in our relegation fight season, we lose 4-0 to Leicester. Um, for one, actually, it just got bad. We were just not showing any desire to try and keep the fans happy, try and show a bit of energy. In fact, we can concede yet another goal. Um, I believe that's now 12 goals we've conceded in the last four games. It's just so bad. And considering all the pressure on the players and the manager, just to have that, it stabs it even more in. And you're just thinking... Oh, just get just get the game over with. Let's just go home and we'll just go again. Yeah. So, re- real quick question: Man of the match, in your opinion, for for both teams? Right. Let's start with West Ham then, because they were the better team on the night. I think Declan Rice has to be it. absolutely controlled midfield, um, both going forward and helping back defensively. Gets the goal as well. I thought he looked like a real machine, really calm and composed. Um, I thought I was really happy with him. I would have said Ben Johnson as well. I thought for how young he is and how well yeah. he's developed through, um, he looks a really superb player considering Kufal's played in that position as well. Um, it's nice to see a bit of youth come through. In terms of Villa, obviously I said Matty Cash. I thought he was superb for us along with Marvellous Nakamba, showing a lot of effort, a lot of desire to get us into the game. Um but when you obviously when you lose, it's not really something you wanna you wanna focus on. You just wanna see see something a bit better from Villa. But yeah, I thought yeah. those players were absolutely superb for both teams. Yeah. Was there anything and I, I appreciate hindsight is always perfect vision, but was there anything that you think that Dean Smith could have done differently before and during the match that could have influenced the outcome more positively for you guys? It's hard to say. I think overall, I wouldn't really argue it was Smith's fault. I think it was just the players just really not trying. I know what people say when Mings was getting dropped and obviously people are like, oh, it's a very big decision. Yet at the same time, these were the same people that were calling for him to need a rest. He's not showing the same form. So it's a little bit, you can't have it both ways. I think House deserved to play um, a game regardless of whatever formation we were going to go with. Um, 
But he went with the formation we wanted. We saw a front three of what we wanted to see. Okay, admittedly, Louise isn't there. The bench isn't what we'd like, obviously, with what's happening between Sanson and some of the injuries like Triore and Trezeguet not being there. But he's gone with what um, he knows best. I don't, I don't really know what else he could have done. I think it was simply just on the players. Um, but I knew, so I knew coming into this game a week prior, you're playing a team that's so informed, a team that's drastically improved. That was in the, almost the same position we were two years ago. Um, it just, it just wasn't going to be our day, and it clearly showed. And last question before we wrap it up, Ben. What can Dean Smith to do do to turn things around, and how much time does he have to do it? Well, that's the big talking point, isn't it? From the Villa camp, I've seen a lot of things come out. From me personally, I don't want him sacked. However, with what the owners have shown with the Milwaukee Bucks, how they come across with the club, I think they're not going to tolerate results like this. I know you've got to stick behind a manager, but the issue is we've had these type of periods for a very long time, throughout every time in the season. It's been four losses now. He's had 100 plus million to spend yet again. Um, we're very close to the relegation zone. I think... If we don't get a result against Southampton, realistically, he should be gone. Um, and then considering the games after that, Southampton, Brighton, Palace, and then City, Leicester, Liverpool, three killer games. Um, I don't really see a win coming from anywhere. I'd argue Southampton, we could just because of how wishy-washy they are, not really consistent enough. Um I don't know. The issue is also trying to find somebody that can be an upgrade on Dean Smith and match what we want to achieve this season, which probably isn't now going to be possible, um, but trying to establish something going into the new year. But I don't know. It's a complete mess. I'd still I'd still stick with, he's got Southampton, it's a must win. If he doesn't, fans will turn. And I just don't see a way back for him from there. Okay, well, Ben, I thank you very much indeed for coming on to the channel and giving us your take on things. I, I know, as I say, I've, I've been here many, many times with West Ham being in, in a bit of a dogfight and things are going against us. And it's it, it can't be nice to sort of front up on, onto a, the, the, a channel you know, that's from an opposition side of things. But I, uh, you know, I, I wish you guys the best of luck for the rest of the season. I hope you guys manage to turn things around as far as Villa's concerned. <laughs> and as far as your YouTube channel's concerned, guys, please get on it. Get yourself over to the Pride of Villa on YouTube. Hit subscribe. <laughs> and please also consider giving them a follow on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. They're two very articulate young men, very polite guys, and they could do with all of the help they can get both on the pitch and as far as their social media platforms are concerned. On the pitch, on the pitch, on the pitch. We need help on the pitch. <laughs> Absolutely. And go, don't forget, guys, to drop a like on the stream, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and make sure you hit that bell icon to be notified of any new content as and when we upload it to the channel. I'm really sorry to do this, Ben, but it's my usual sign out, I'm afraid. <laughs> Come on, you irons. Oh, oh. God.